This course is about distributed systems. So I'm going to first give kind of an introduction to give a motivation, but there's going to be a lot of algorithms and formal specifications, formal discussions. This is a very solid course. We're going to look at the difficult parts of real distributed systems. But today I want to first give you kind of a teaser, an introduction. So first of all, what is a distributed system? So this guy made a definition, kind of a funny definition. A distributed system is a one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. Uh, so some other computer crashes and you cannot do anything. So it's basically a, a program running on many computers. So I don't know if you know who this guy is. Does anybody know who this guy is? He's a very famous computer scientist. Lambert. You know, you should shut up. Okay, so this guy is very famous. He's actually one of the main founders of the whole area of distributed algorithms. He won the Turing Award a couple years ago, which is like the Nobel Prize for computer science. So it's Mr. Leslie Lamport. Okay, Leslie Lamport. So it's nice that you know what he looks like. In case you run into him, you can say that thanks to him, you learned a lot about distributed systems. So a distributed system is a set of nodes, uh, computing nodes, connected by a network which appear to its users as a single coherent system. So you have a program running, uh, parts of the program running on many nodes, they're talking to each other through this network, and they're giving some kind of an overall functionality. So a single coherent system. So that's what a distributed system is. It's a bunch of nodes that work together. So in this course, we're going to really study what this means. And this actually, there's actually problems. It's actually hard to write good programs for this. So we're going to look at the basic concepts, models, foundations. So you get a really good foundation. And after this course, you can basically go in many directions. But you'll have all of the important basic ideas. So. Why are distributed systems important? It's kind of obvious, right? I mean, the internet is a very large distributed system. On top of the IP communication, there's the World Wide Web, which is also a distributed system. And many, many small devices are connected together. Mobile phones, for example, they all make distributed systems. And uh, this project, of course, is also going to be distributed systems. So distributed systems are everywhere, and it's getting more and more. And so it's important to understand them. So what we want to do is talk about scalability, so the size. So internet is one of the biggest, of course. It has like billions of nodes. But even smaller systems can be complicated. Reliability and the distribution aspect. How do you organize programs? Okay. So there's many examples. So here's a data. Here, this is a, a data center, lots of racks in it. Here's a very old one. This is the Space Shuttle, 1981. Actually, there are four identical computers in there doing the same computation. And so if one of them crashes, the other three can continue. So there's a vote going on. So this is an example of a fault-tolerant distributed system. So if one of them crashes, the three will continue to work. Of course, when one of them crashes, in real life, the, the pilot gets a little panicky because if one crash, maybe the second one can crash too for the same reason, you don't know. But if, if it's only one, if it's some cosmic ray, for example, that caused the computer to crash, the others can continue. So a distributed system increases reliability. Okay? But it's actually kind of difficult and if you started learning programming, you start with sequential programs, first year, then concurrent programs with multiple threads, and the next step up is distributed systems. And one of the reasons why it's very hard is because of partial failure. So when the system fails, when something crashes, it's not the whole system that crashes, but only part of the system, and the rest of the system is still running, so it could keep working. So how do you organize it 
so that the system still does useful work if there's a partial failure. So with usual computers, it crashes. Huh? If you have a Windows machine, you see it crash, then uh, it's very easy. You cannot do anything. But on the internet, if something crashes, the rest keeps running. Okay. So you want to organize the system so that it keeps giving functionality even when there's partial failures. And of course, there's also the concurrency aspect. All the nodes, the computing nodes, are executing in parallel, so they're independent of each other. So in the program, you see them as concurrent. Okay. You see them as independent activities that are progressing independently of each other without uh, necessarily uh, giving any kind of synchronization, but they might. So there are no nodes are executing in parallel, and they send messages, and the messages are traveling asynchronously. What that means is that you don't know how much time it takes for the messages to send. You get, you, maybe you know some bounds, but in general, you only kind of vaguely know how long it will take. Will it be 1.5 milliseconds, or 3.7, or 10, or 100? It could be anything, okay? And it can change very quickly. If there's congestion, if there's failure, if there's radio problems, whatever. So the timing is very variable, and it's asynchronous. So it means that you don't have any bounds. It could be any time. So all of that makes distributed systems hard. And in this course, we're going to look directly at the hard stuff. We're going to see how to make it work, even in the worst case. So you have to think that in a real system, in the real world, okay, any kind of a failure is going to happen. So you have to change the mindset. Okay, failure is a normal occurrence. Things, parts of your system failing for various reasons, messages dropping, notes failing. It's not a weird thing, it's normal. And the bigger the system is, the more widespread it is, the more you get failures. Okay? So you have to change the idea that failure is a weird thing and oh well, we don't want failure. Failure is going to happen a lot, okay? And in this project, you're going to see failure happening. So these grips boards, maybe they crash, maybe the communication goes down, maybe the batteries uh, run out, whatever. They can go down for any reason. And that's a normal occurrence, okay? So failure is normal. That's one of the main important points for this course. So, right now, in this course, we're going to see lots of algorithms and concepts to do that. But, right now, today's lecture, I want to give you an introduction. And basically, there's a few very important core problems that have reappear all over again and again when you're building a distributed system. They're like the main ideas when you have a distributed system, and they keep Reappear. So let me give some intuition. So right now I want to give you some intuition on the kinds of core problems. And already then you get some idea of what the course, what we're going to do. Okay? So let me give you a, a famous problem, actually, that uh, was first talked about by Leslie Lamport, called the two generals problem. Okay? So you have a, a field. You have two hills here. You have one, one army here and another army here. And you have, this is the enemy in the valley. So these two armies are allies and there's two generals. Each one is the boss of its army. They need to coordinate the attack. That means they need to agree on the time. They will only win if they attack at the same time. So how do they talk to each other? So this was in the Middle Ages. There was no radio. So they have messengers, okay? Messengers running between the two and sending messages. Huh? Maybe coded messages, whatever. But the messengers might have to go through this enemy territory so they can be captured or killed. Uh, maybe they don't make it. 
So these generals are sending messengers to each other, and the messengers might be captured and killed on the way. Okay? So how do we get the generals to agree on a time? So you can see this is very much like a distributed system, no? Here we have two nodes, and the, the messengers is like the network between them. How do we get these two to agree? That they can guarantee agree. So here we have two generals, G1 and G2. Okay, so General G1 says, I want to attack tomorrow at 7 in the morning. I send a message, I send a messenger to this G2. Okay, but how can G1 be sure that G2 got the message? How can he be sure? Well, G2 can send uh, an acknowledgement. Okay, he can send another messenger back. Back with an acknowledgement saying, yes, yes, I did get the message. Okay, and then fine. But how does G2 know that G1 got the acknowledgement? You see where I'm going now, huh? Because each of these messengers can disappear. How does to ensure G1? Well, G1 can acknowledgement the receipt of the acknowledgement. Okay, so yes, yes, I did receive your acknowledgement. And the messenger can go away. You don't have, you don't know how long the message takes. So it does not look so obvious, huh? So in the common case, when the messengers uh, are traveling back and forth, sometimes you can be kind of sure with some probability. But can you guarantee, is there an algorithm that will guarantee that these two generals will agree on the time, even if there is some chance that the messages are lost? Does such an algorithm exist? That's a typical kind of question for a distributed system. And you can see that it's kind of useful if I have two nodes on the internet, they, have to, they want to agree on something. Maybe, they're, maybe they have databases and they are in a bank and they want to agree on how much money they have in the bank. Then it's important that they agree. Yeah? Okay, so is there an algorithm to do it? Well, actually there's not an algorithm. You can prove that in this case, in this particular example, when you don't know the time of the message, messenger, and that each messenger has the probability of being eliminated, that it's not possible to define an algorithm where you could guarantee the two generals will agree. So this is actually a famous impossibility result. Okay? This is a famous impossibility result, showing that distributed systems in the general case, it's very hard or even impossible. Okay. So this example is like a distributed system. Okay. Two nodes need to agree on a value of the time of the attack. And they communicate by messages using an unreliable channel. So this is a, an example of an algorithm like that. So in this particular case, this agreement is impossible. So what do we do? Agreement actually is a core problem. It's actually pretty clear that if you want to build a system with many nodes, probably you want them to agree on things. Okay? So agreement is actually a core problem in distributed systems. So in the most general case of an asynchronous system, where you don't know the time, and messages can be lost, Agreement is impossible. But that's kind of annoying, right? Okay? So this algorithm in a distributed system is called consensus. So consensus algorithm. So the consensus problem is that all nodes propose a value. So general G1 says, I want to attack at 7. G2 says, I want to attack at 11. They run an algorithm and they have to agree. Some nodes might crash and stop responding. Here it's the message loss. You might also have nodes can crash 
okay? And stop responding. So the algorithm has to ensure that all the correct nodes, so the nodes that did not crash, they eventually decide, they decide the same value, and they only decide values that have been proposed. Huh? In fact, it's very easy to have only two of these three conditions. Huh? For example, all the nodes can just say, we'll decide at 5 o'clock in the morning. No matter what happens, we decide 5. Well, that means the third condition is not held. Huh? The value 5 was not proposed. Huh? And decide the same. If each node decides its own value, uh, general G1 decides 7, G2 decides 11, well, the second condition is not done. Uh, or all nodes, they have to decide. Maybe G1 never decides because it never gets the messages. Okay? It never decides. Well, if the other node decides something, it doesn't really work because they all have to decide. Okay? So the trick is how do you get all three of those conditions? That's actually a hard problem, okay? And in, in the two generals case, it's even impossible to solve this, okay? So, is it really so important, this problem? Well, it is important. It's a typical problem, and you all are you doing this, everybody, who has a bank account and uh, has already used this kind of a consensus algorithm. So a bank will store the information on the account in a database, but to make sure that the, it's reliable, they will have multiple copies of that database. <coughs> and they will put them at different places, not even in the same building, because if there's a fire in the building, it might destroy all the databases in that building. So it's actually a requirement that the databases be wide spread, separated by many kilometers, okay? And they have to be agreeing on each other, okay? They have to agree. If I put 10 euros in my account, if I transfer 10 euros from one account to another, it has to be the same in both databases, and we don't know about the message delays, we don't know that maybe the database might crash, or maybe uh, then the others have to still agree. So and we don't know how long the messages are going to take. Uh, we know maybe approximately. We don't know for sure. So if I if, if I add uh, if I do 10 euro transfer from one account to another, and then there's another transaction that adds one percent, maybe it's like interest. Okay, then. It depends on whether the 1% is added before or after the 10 euros gets there. And then the two databases, it should be the same order. Okay, so they have to agree on that order. Uh, operations, they have to agree on the order. So that means they have to do consensus. So this is not just a theoretical problem. It is not practical. The whole internet economy is based on this. Okay, is based on this kind of an algorithm. And it's based, it's based on consensus. So doing it right is important. Of course, there do exist algorithms. Uh, otherwise, banks would not be able to be computerized or be running on the internet. So there is some, something that works. So in this course, you're going to see how that works in real life. Okay? And the real hard problem. So in a database, the, the consensus is actually called atomic commit. So databases, they use transactions. You've probably seen what a transaction is. So a transaction makes a change of the state of the database, and it's all or none. So there's nothing in between. Either the state is changed, or it stays the original state. So if two databases do a transaction, two copies, they either both commit, or they both abort. You're not allowed to have one commit and one abort, okay? Because they would be incoherent. So here, the consensus has only two values. If one database copy aborts, then basically they all have to abort, okay? So you have to, they have to agree on it. Or they all agree on commit. 
but they have to agree. So this is a typical example of consensus. Okay, so uh, in this case, if you have asynchronous communication, it's impossible, okay? But there are other cases where it will be possible. Other models where it is possible to do consensus. Because otherwise, we could pack our bags and the course would be over. It's very easy. Well, let's do distributed algorithms. They're impossible. Okay, it's all over. Actually, that's true in the most general case of asynchronous systems. Many things are impossible. But in other cases, which are called synchronous or partially synchronous, when you know something about the message times, you can make it possible. Okay? So we're going to study that very carefully in this course. So you're going to understand when it's possible and when it's not possible. So here's another core problem, which is called atomic broadcast. So broadcast is something you know. Uh, when I s broadcast a message to many nodes, I send a message and all of the nodes receive that message. So that's a broadcast. But atomic broadcast is actually stronger than that. It does a little bit more. So in a regular broadcast, if the sender is correct, all correct nodes will deliver the message. That means all the applications running on those nodes will get the message. So I'm being very precise here. Huh? There's a sending node. Correct means the node has not crashed. And the rest destination is also correct. If the destination does not crashes, it delivers the message. That means it gives the message to the application running on that node. So that's what a broadcast does. But atomic broadcast does more than that. First of all, all correct nodes will deliver the same messages. It's not possible for a message to go to one node and then to be dropped on the other. They will all get the same messages. And they will all get them in the same order. That means if I have two transactions in my database, T1 and T2, then the first copy will get T1 and T2, both. The second copy will also get T1 and T2, both. It's not possible for T1 to only go to the first copy, not to the second. And they will be in the same order. So if T1 arrives before T2 at the first copy, it will arrive in the same order for the second copy, T1 before T2. So this, with this, I can actually implement my bank. Okay? If I have atomic broadcast, I know the two transactions will be arriving in the same order. And, there will be the, and none of them will be lost. Okay? Actually, atomic broadcast is the same, the same problem as consensus. This is kind of not obvious thing. So atomic broadcast and consensus are actually the same thing. So I'm going to show that now. That's not an obvious thing until you think about it a little bit. But so what that means is that if I have an atomic broadcast algorithm, which will broadcast to all nodes without missing any in the same order, I can use it to implement a consensus algorithm where all nodes propose a value and they agree on the, on the same value. So if I have atomic broadcast, I can implement consensus. And if I have consensus implemented, I can use that to implement atomic broadcast. So in that sense, they're equivalent. If I have one, I can easily do the other one. So they're actually solving a, the same problem. Okay. So how do we do it? What's the intuition? Well, let's say we have an atomic broadcast algorithm. Okay, we're given atomic broadcast. Each node of the system as part of the algorithm, and we can do atomic broadcast. We can actually use that to solve consensus. How could we do that? Yeah? The node could, uh, each node would send a vision to all the other nodes, right. the value which uh, it right. wants to, to use. Right. 
And so every node will get a new a right order, every other possibility. Right. Yeah, that's basically the idea. So each node will broadcast its proposed value, and the atomic broadcast guarantees they will all receive in the same order. So that the nodes then can just take the first value that arrives and say, that's my decision, that's the consensus. And the atomic broadcast will guarantee it's the same. Okay. So, so every node broadcasts its proposal, and every node decides the first received proposal. And the atomic broadcast will guarantee that they're coming in the same order, so they will decide the same. So that's, that's consensus. They all propose, and they all agree. Okay. What about the other direction? What about assuming that I have a consensus algorithm? I can use that to make an atomic broadcast. How do I do that? So consensus, basically, they all propose a value. You run the algorithm, and they all decide on the same type, so they agree. How can I use that to do atomic broadcast? Yeah? Uh, I, I must be wrong, but I feel like the CIP theorem uh, kind of is a problem here for, uh, for this. Ah, OK. I'm not, uh, so you already know some, so the theorem you're talking about, you're, you're talking about the impossibility result. Yes. yes. Well, the impossibility result, yeah, so here I'm assuming it's possible, the consensus. Okay, yeah, maybe I was a little bit confusing. In this general, two generals example, I'm assuming completely asynchronous. So I don't know the times. Okay? Whereas if you have a system which is synchronous or partially synchronous, then you can solve consensus. I'll say a little bit more, or atomic brightness. Yeah, so this. All of this, what I'm saying here, of course, does not apply in the asynchronous case when it's impossible. But it applies in the cases when it is possible. There are cases when it is possible. Okay. okay. So, uh, so I gave the most extreme case here, the asynchronous case, where it's not possible to do consensus and not to do atomic broadcast either. But in the... Um, in reality, luckily, most real distributed systems are not completely asynchronous. Okay? So there are cases when the consensus is possible, which is the case, for example, when you have a bound on the message delay. When your message cannot last forever, you know there's a number bound, then you can actually solve consensus. Okay? So it's not completely impossible. Otherwise, we wouldn't have anything to do. Okay? So if, if I give you now, if I give you a consensus algorithm, so everyone proposes a value, they run the algorithm, and they all agree on the same value, I can actually use this to implement an atomic broadcast algorithm. So how could I do that? So the little d means that we make like a little discussion, and maybe somebody has the idea of how to do it. So how do you? do atomic broadcast if you're given consensus. So everyone can agree, but how can I use it to solve atomic broadcast where the messages are received in the same order? So somehow I have to formulate atomic broadcast as a kind of agreement problem. So how is atomic broadcast doing agreement? What are they agreeing on? actually, when you do an atomic broadcast. What is the agreement? Because consensus, they're agreeing on a value. The value could be anything, right? They're agreeing. So if I want to do atomic broadcast, I can use this agreement. But how do I formulate this messages received in the same order as an agreement? Yeah. Who will send first? Which node will send this message first? If we uh, have the uh, hypothesis of um, a synchronous uh, system, if we know which node is going to send first, we know which message is going to be received right. first. So the nodes can agree on which message will come first. Or they can agree on the order 
of messages. Huh? They can agree, and for example, each node says, I think this message should come first, M1 or M3 or M5. They run consensus, and the consensus says, we agree on M3. And then all the nodes agree, okay, M3 comes first. And in that way, they have received the message in the same order. You see, so basically they agree on the order of messages. So if you, if you, you basically, the consensus algorithm, each node receives messages. Let's say I receive a couple of messages, and then I propose an order. And all of the nodes, they maybe receive a few messages. Doesn't matter, maybe the messages are lost, but they receive some messages, and they propose an order. Then the consensus is run, and then they will all agree on one order. And then that's the order that the messages are given to the application. Okay? So basically they are agreeing on the order. So if you do it like that, you can see that given consensus you can implement atomic broadcast and the other direction too, so that atomic broadcast and consensus they might seem like very different problems at first glance, but actually they're equivalent problems. Okay? They're equivalent, which means that it's very straightforward when you're given one to implement the other. So we will define formally what that means. Uh, basically, you can implement one easily given the other in both directions. So they are just as hard. If, you, if one of them is impossible, then the other is impossible. One of them is possible, the other is possible. Okay. So those two core problems is actually the same core problem. Actually, consensus is one of the most basic core problems. Okay. So atomic broadcast is equivalent to consensus. Okay, so let's talk now a little bit about concurrency and about failure, about partial failure. So remember two of the main things for distributed systems were concurrency and were failure. So let me give you some intuition on this. Okay? So today, basically, I want to give you some intuition. So first of all, I told you that there's these core problems, that it's not obvious because sometimes some problems are actually impossible. And you can't do them. In a two generals and an asynchronous is impossible. But other problems are possible. I explained that it's important and that atomic broadcast and consensus are actually equivalent problems. So let's talk a little bit about concurrency. So the two generals problem, we modeled it as an asynchronous system. Asynchronous. What that means is that when I send a message from one node to another, there is no time bound. So that's the most general case. Okay? I send a message, and I don't know how long it will take. All I know is that the message will eventually arrive. If it doesn't, if the system doesn't, if the message is not failed, it will eventually arrive in a finite time. But I don't know the balance on the time. And also the computation time, so the system will also be doing computations on the computing nodes, there's no balance on that time either. So the most general case of a distributed system is an asynchronous system. It's also the hardest case. Huh? And unfortunately, the internet, the way it's constructed, is essentially asynchronous. There are no uh, magic times. You don't look at, it all depends on how many hops. So if you send a message from one node, internet node, to another internet node, anywhere in the world, there's actually no built-in time limit to how long that will take in the internet, okay, in TCP. It's an essentially asynchronous system, theoretically. So that means it's actually a hard case. It's very hard to undo things on the internet. For example, when uh, two nodes communicate, the node 2 is expecting a message from node 1, okay? So it's expecting a message from node 1, and maybe node 1 has failed, so failure is important. Or maybe the message is lost, 
Or maybe the message is not lost, but it will eventually arrive. So node 2 is waiting for the message. And there's no way it can make the difference between a slow message and a failed node. If it has not received the message, it, it does not know whether the node 1 has failed or not. So the problem with asynchronous system is that you have very little information going around. You don't really know anything. I'm trying to receive a message from node 1 and I get nothing. So what do I know? I don't know very much. Okay? So that's the basic situation of an asynchronous system. An internet is basically like that. So if we want to make distributed algorithms on the internet, we have to solve this problem. Okay? That the internet was actually designed to be essentially asynchronous. The algorithms underlying the internet are asynchronous algorithms. Okay. And consensus cannot be solved in an asynchronous system if even a single node can crash. So the problem is the partial failure. If I have 10 nodes talking to each other, and they all propose, but one of the nodes maybe has crashed, or maybe it's just slow, or maybe the message is just very slow because it's an asynchronous system, then I cannot define a consensus algorithm that works in such a system. It's impossible. Okay? So it's a famous impossibility. So asynchronous systems are hard. And in some simple cases, it's even impossible. Okay? So this is an intuition, huh? So remember, today I'm giving you intuition. So you can see that asynchronous systems, you actually have not so much information. So it's hard to tell when a node actually fails. In fact, you don't know. You can't know for sure if a node fails or if the message is very slow. There's no way to make the difference. You wait and you wait and you wait. You don't receive a message. Has the node failed? Well, actually, you don't know. Okay. So this has a lot of implications. Asynchronous is hard. But then there's a spectrum. There's the other side, which is called synchronous. So asynchronous is on one side, and synchronous is the other side. So there's a different kind of distributed system called a synchronous system, where you do have a time bound. There is a known time bound on the time to send a message and a known bound of the time to compute. So, for example, if I have two nodes connected by a wire, then I know how long it's going to take, okay? On the internet, I don't know, because of the routing and congestion, and, but here, if I have two nodes connected by a wire that are close together, then I do have a bound, okay? So when I know the bound, the system is called synchronous. And synchronous systems are much, much easier to program for than asynchronous. So for example, a local area network, like in a, in a building, or a cluster, where you have a, a bunch of computing boards with a backplane, are essentially synchronous systems, because you have a known bound. You know that it, the message will always be less than 100 microseconds, for example, on a cluster, or one and a half millisecond. You know that's an upper bound. So why is that so useful? Well, it's useful because it gives you information. Okay. Okay. You know when a node has crashed. If I'm expecting a message from node one, and I don't receive it in one and a half millisecond, then I'm sure that node 1 has crashed. If, I, if I'm running an algorithm and node 1 is supposed to send me a message, and I know that, and I don't receive the message in the bound, then I know for sure that node 1 has crashed. It means I have information, which I do not have in an asynchronous system. So, in a synchronous system, distributed algorithms are much easier, well, whereas in an asynchronous system, it's very hard. So, if you look at consensus, or consensus algorithm, which is impossible here, it's actually easily solvable in a synchronous system with up to n minus 1 crashes. 
So if I have n nodes, they're all proposing, 100 nodes, for example, and 99 of them crash, or 55, or any number, as long as there's one node that's still running, I can do consensus. So it's actually extremely easy to do consensus in a this, in this synchronous system. So the intuition of that is the information. Intuition is accurate crash detection. Every node sends a message to every other node. If I do not receive a message from a node within the bound, I know for sure that the node has crashed. I'm guaranteed, I know that for sure, because the system is synchronous, okay? Whereas in an asynchronous system, there's no bound, I don't know. So in a synchronous system, I can do accurate crash detection. So if I have 100 nodes and 95 of them crash, the five nodes that survive, they will be able to detect that without fail. They will detect it reliably, and they will know that there's only five surviving nodes, and they will do consensus among themselves. There will not, never be any confusion over which node has crashed. Okay? So synchronous systems allow accurate crash detection. And distributed algorithms are easy. The problem is the internet is not a system like that. Okay? The internet is much closer to this side. So if all systems in the world were synchronous, life would be very easy. Uh, um, this would not be a course that, that uh, would require a lot of thinking, okay? If all systems were synchronous, things would be very, very simple. But in real life, that can't be the case. If you want to make the internet a synchronous system, how do you do it? Well, it's very easy. You just take the slowest possible communication from one side to the other of the world, from uh, uh, Europe to Australia, the slowest goes with the most congestion, and you make that be the bound. So basically, you slow down the system so it becomes synchronous. But that makes the internet extremely slow, because then what is that bound? It's going to be very high. It will be under the somewhere in the range of seconds, okay? For a computer that can run instructions in nanoseconds, that's not acceptable. So we cannot force systems to be synchronous. Uh, we can make all systems synchronous by rendering them sufficiently slowly. But that would be completely impractical and the internet would collapse. Okay? It would be billions of times slower than the current internet. So the internet is not synchronous. So the question is, how do we solve it now? The internet is more like here. Uh, and on this side, it's either hard or it's impossible. On this side, things are easy. So we would like to be here, but in real life, we're actually here. The internet is here. And the systems we are going to build in this course we're, will be systems that are running on the internet, okay? Not on a LAN or on a cluster. We want to look at this case. We want to solve this case. So what can we do? So how do we solve this problem? The internet is mostly asynchronous, which is very hard, and we can't really make it synchronous. That would be easy. So how do we solve that problem? Ah. Well, this is a great moment for a break. Okay. So this is a cliffhanger. So after the break, I'll tell you how we solve the problem. Okay, I'll have a little bit of a pause.